Thank you. Um, this one? Okay, cool. So, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Susan, and I'm a project manager at Naturales Biodiversity Center in the Netherlands. Um, I today I'm going to give you a short introduction about Naturales itself and about our digitization project. We started in 2010, and um, we're almost finishing now by June 2015. Um, it's a little bit a different story than Jason because we are busy digitizing our collection and putting everything online and preserving it so we're not taking out a website or anything. Um, so I will tell you about our digitization project, about our goals, our prioritization, the process of classification we did, um, our so-called digi streets or digitization streets we implemented image preservation, our enrichment and disclosure, and some challenge, challenges we faced during the process. So, Naturalis is um, the uh, national museum for national history in the Netherlands, and also uh, the leading institute for uh, academic research and education on taxonomy and biodiversity. Currently, we have a collection of 37 million objects and um, about nine exhibitions a year, 300,000 visitors, and that makes us one of the largest museums in the Netherlands. In 2013, there was a merger of several institutes and museums, uh, which made our collection this big of 37 million objects, and which also forced us to have a rebuild our our actually our current museum. Um, I don't have a pointer, but this is our museum as it is now. And we're gonna close in one year and we're gonna add this part. It doesn't really show on scale, but we're almost gonna triple in size. That is needed to um, preserve all our collection, to store everything in the same place. Currently, Naturales has buildings spread over town in uh, Leiden because we can't host all our collections. Um, and the new museum also gives us a chance to um, show a T-Rex. I don't know if everybody knows what a T-Rex is. Um, yeah? <laughs> cool. We're very proud of it. We just bought a T-Rex uh, skeleton. <laughs> yeah. And um, we're preserving it. It's in, in America, and it's the first T-Rex that is leaving America because there's only one now on show in America. So this is the first T-Rex that will be shown in the museum outside America. So in a few years, I think 2018, we should be finished. You should all come and watch our T-Rex. Um, let me see. Um, so I already told you in 2010, we were um, granted with a significant grant for a digitization project. And uh, we had to relocate our collections to establish DNA barcoding facility and to digitize a large part of the specimens from our collection. So I will show you now a movie uh, that gives you a good idea about our digitization project. I chose to do the long one, five minute movie because we have time. I hope it works. Why it doesn't move? Do you know why it doesn't work? It just did. I can do it again. Check if I load it again, if it works. It's just on YouTube. So if you want to um, check it yourself later at home. There we are. This is the collection tower of the Naturalis Biodiversity Center. It is the place where our national natural history heritage is kept. The Naturalis collection contains no fewer than 37 million zoological, botanical and geological objects and is therefore one of the five largest collections of the world.
Naturalis is currently digitizing a part of this enormous collection. Access will be offered in this way to the safely stored objects for today's and tomorrow's scientists. Seven million objects must be accessible digitally by 2015 for everyone everywhere in the world at any time. The questions of the hour are, of course, how do you digitize seven million objects and what can we do with it? We will take a look at the digitizing of the insect collection that is also called the entomological collection to answer these questions. This is the place where it is done, the entomology digitizing system site. Naturalis has a total of 10 of this type of digitizing system sites. Every type of object, after all, requires its own way of digitizing. Currently, 850,000 insects are entering the digital era here at the entomology digitizing system site. This is only part of the overall entomological collection. Naturalis has no fewer than 17 million insects overall. The choice has been made to only digitize those parts of the insect collection that are of most importance to science. These are the ones. Digitizing insects is precision work. First, they must be taken out of the collection. A number of small labels can be found under every insect. The scientific name, where and when the insect was found and who found it are specified on these labels. All of this information is entered into a database developed by Naturalis by specially training digitizing employees, the collection registration system. The entered information will next be linked to a unique number that is shown on a label with a barcode. The drawer where the insects are kept is also provided with such a barcode. This ensures that insects can be easily linked to the drawer. When all insects have been entered into the database, the full drawer will be photographed in high resolution. Digitizing this insect drawer is now nearly complete. The cupboard where the drawer can be found is also provided with a barcode. This ensures that the information of every insect is linked to the place where it is found in the collection tower. It is now much easier for the Naturalis' collection administrators and scientists to find objects in the collection. With one push of the button, they can now see whether a species is in the collection how many there are and where they can be exactly found in the collection tower. The natural history world is entering a new era with the large-scale digitizing of the collection, an era in which work can take place faster and more accurately, in which collections are linked to each other on a global scale, and the dissemination of knowledge about biodiversity is growing and growing, an era in which more than ever new application options are being created that, until recently, could only be imagined. Naturalis's researchers are currently, for example, already experimenting with bumblebees and other bees by scanning their wings with a camera on a smartphone. The potential for this type of application is huge. A farmer or owner of an orchard could, for example, later see in no time at all which bee species has produced his harvest. The quicker he finds out, the faster he can adjust his management. These types of applications are impossible without digitizing. Day in and day out, around 70 assistants work on digitizing our national natural history heritage. It is a huge task that will take quite some more years. It is, however, also a process that will later become a permanent part of our collection administrator's day-to-day -day work. We will continue to work on a better dissemination of knowledge about the diversity of life. Naturalis will, therefore, continue to be the place where scientists work together to ensure that nature is constantly better understood. So that gives you um, an idea about the project we are uh, working on. Um, oh, I have to do this one again. Yeah. <laughs> One simple drawer, and within it, 20 carefully prepared specimens. Okay, I do 
didn't know that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. So I will tell you a bit more, a a bit more now about our process and how uh, we did everything. So with the budget of 13 million dollars uh, of euros, we had to digitize at least seven million objects on a high level, meaning there had to be a picture and the metadata had to be entered on the object level. Of the remaining 30 million objects, we had to digitize on a higher level, meaning we only have to do the metadata and where it is found in the collection. Because if we wanted to do digitize 37 million objects on a high level, that would take us, I don't know, how many years? Well, this, this took us five years, seven million, so you can do the math. Um, and we have to develop a permanent infrastructure to continue digitization. As met mentioned in the movie, there are about 70 people working now on this project. It ends in June this year, meaning <coughs> 70 people leaving Naturalis, but now the organization has to take over um, because we have to continue uh, our digitization in order to uh, yeah, get new assets of our collection also online. So this is a schematic overview of our approach uh, to the digitization process um, in our organization. And I will walk you now through the most important steps. Our first step, obviously, is to prioritize. We had to collect all proposals from the organization. We have hundreds of researchers and uh, collection employees who had ideas about their collection which had to be digitized. We had to include specific benefits for research, for our collection management and for our exhibitions. Um, then we had to make a selection with a small group of staff and our stakeholders. Then a list came for our management to approve and finally we had a list of prioritized projects we would digitize and 20% for unspent future ideas. The challenge here was to determine which 7 million objects deserved to be um, digitized on a uh, higher level um, and the other 30 million on a lower level and to do it within the budget of 13 million euros. Um, the next step of our process is the classification. So how are you going to digitize all these objects? First, we made a choice in quantity over quality. We decided to do it at 300 dpi. That was the, the quality we wanted. And um, we thought it was important that we could digitize a lot that would help researchers a lot instead of doing a niche. We um, based our digitization process on collection types. So wet collections, dry collections, microcopic slides and printed uh, publications. Um, and it enabled us to digitize any collection, any type of category regardless of its content. Um, what makes it unique that all different types are uh, digitized at the same time. For instance, our entomology collection you just saw, the insects, they are preserved on alcohol, but they also are on m in microscopic slides or they're on a pin, what you saw in the movie. So the insects are digitized in three different digitization streets, as we call it. In the movie you saw with all the bumblebees and the butterflies, um, that is our dry collection entomology street. But we also have an alcohol street. Um, I will come back to our digital streets shortly. Um, as was mentioned in the movie, we um, implemented um, digital streets and we need a new approach for digitization um, in order to process the numbers we um, made it industrial and we implemented processes to prioritize the collections and uh, made certain decisions and I will walk you through it now. We divided um, complicated and labor intensive processes into, into a series of shorter tasks to gain specialization. So we really made it like a production approach. We based it on collection types as I just mentioned 
we standardized our data entry process and we developed our own central registration system for all collections. Um, we limited the metadata capture to a minimum uh, and uh, specified for what was needed for the researchers. So we didn't enter all data that was on a label, but we specified certain um, um, information that was of most value. Because as you can imagine, the, the bumblebees, they have a very, very tiny label. But other collection, uh, like our herbarium, I will talk about you later, that is dried plants, um, they could have like 10 labels, like this big, with the researcher or whoever found the plant just talking about where he found it behind the bridge, the last behind a, a tree or whatever. Um, so we had to limit it, what we would capture. And we only capture photographic reproduction of specimen and label information where this has proven an added value. And last, <coughs> we um, decided to use uh, third parties for digitization <coughs> when, of course, it made sense, price, quality, driven. I will give you an example um, right ahead. So for each collection, we implement implemented a production line. Uh, we had a total of 10 digitization streets or digi streets, and currently there are seven still operational. We have one in our museum that you see in the bottom photo. Um, this is the glass street or the street of microscopic slides, and in the back to ge for um, geology, and this allows the public to participate and to see what we're doing in the museum. So this is actually, we call it life science. Um, so this is an area where the visitors can ask questions to our staff, so what they're doing, why they're doing it, how they're doing it. Um, and that's proven really successful because the audience is really interested in what we're doing and all the numbers because they actually don't have a clue um, how much it is. Um, I will tell you now a bit about two of our digi streets. And this is the DigiSheet for microscopic slides to show you that we made it really a uh, production and industrial approach to our digitization. Um, which is graphically shown is that we, th on the left side is our collection tower. So everything has to be pulled from the tower. Each slide has given its own code, also like for entomology. Then it's put on a big template with hundreds of slides, a picture has been made, and then a computer program overnight um, chops it into 100 separate slides, as shown in the bottom. And then the slides are put back into the tower and also given a, a label onto the, um, what you say, the drawer where it's in, because we need to know where it is. As you can imagine, with 37 million objects, uh, you lose track quite easily. Um, and then uh, the next step is that the metadata is entered. We do that verbatim, and that means that we just type in what is said on the label. Sometimes researchers make mistakes, but uh, we learned if we allow our staff to in interpret that more mistakes are made, because not everybody has the exact knowledge to know um, what the researcher meant. So if they see there's a mistake made, they type in the mistake. Um, and that's a choice we made in order to reduce the number of mistakes that people could make. Uh, and professional collection, uh, the owners of these collections, they walk through it and sometimes they clean up uh, small mistakes. Another street um, is our herbarium <coughs> street. And I think this is the best, um, um, how do you say that in English, uh, example of mass digitization. Because here we had to digitize about 4.5 4 million herbarium sheets. So that's an example of a herbarium sheet. Maybe you, when I was a child, I also dried plants within two wooden um, plates and then with screws, and then you would have your own little leaves. This is done professionally worldwide. I, I had no clue. 
but there are like millions and millions and millions of these kind of sheets. And they're used by researchers for medicine um, research or how um, a plant evolves during ages because we got sheets from 1500s. Um, but with four and a half million sheets, it's quite a challenge to do it manually. So we contracted a, um, another company, uh, Pictura, and outsourced it, and together we developed conveyor belts, and, um, which standardized the scanning process. We had automatic quality checks, and about 35,000 35, scans a day were made when we were full up speed. Um, and I will show you a short movie. This is a very annoying sound, so I'll tell you myself. <laughs> so this is our herbarium collection. The boxes are transported uh, to the street and each get a barcode. In the past, collections were uh, preserved with mercury to prevent insects from biting. So we had mercury extracted. Everything is placed onto the conveyor belt by one employee. And you see two lines. So the first, the line here, these are not digitized, but only the sheets uh, in the first row are digitized. So each sheet is then straightened against Marcus and gets a sheet barcode. There's a big black box that makes a photo of each. And then in the automatic process, it's cropped, a logo is entered. We do a quality check of the color, sharpness. And if there's a mistake or the person here makes a mistake, he can stop the conveyor belt at any time. And in the end, everything is put back in the box in exactly the same order. And the process starts again. So um, did exceed this process exceeded our expectations as well because we were finished in uh, less than a year with digitizing four and a half million. It took us about 10 months and then we were finished. We thought it would take us two years um, because we thought in the beginning we would do about 15,000 scans a day, which is already a large number. Uh, but in the end, we did 35,000. Um, so that really proved that uh, a solution for this type of collection uh, really worked. But how do you preserve all these images? As you can imagine, it's, it's a huge amount of data. So we decided to store our TIFF files, so the high-resolution files, at a Dutch Institute for Image and Sound. And we made our own uh, derivatives of JPEGs in three um, sizes. We have small one, medium one, and larger one, so we can use ourselves. We put them, we've developed our own image library, and the image library is actually the um, host for all our websites, all our collection registration systems, so all images are in there and just linked <coughs> to our own image server. Um, otherwise, if we would store the images ourselves, that would take so much data and cost a lot. Um, and, and this really works well, um, is our um, and Richmond, I can give you three examples of uh, how our data is enriched. We've um, come up with a crowdsourcing project uh, to let the public participate in our process. We did it with the microscopic slides. Um, it's with a Dutch company it's actually called Many Hands, uh, translated directly. And um, you could I log in online and you could transcribe. And we had competitions online, so you could see who was actually a bit what Jason had, who was winning and on top. And if a person <coughs> did a lot of transcriptions, they would get a free ticket to the museum. And it was also for us a test to see if, uh, if the public would participate and how much data we would gain. And in the end, in a period of nine months of time, they did about 200,000 transcriptions. And that's quite a lot. Then we had to validate them, and 100,000 were left. Because, of course, mistakes were made. So we couldn't just put everything in our, into our collect 
collection registration system, but um, in the end, about 100,000. I think still that's a large uh, number um, from a participation project. We've also started a project for georeferencing, and we developed a way uh, to determine the geographical coordinates and their accuracy based on the geographic description. And we made that automatic and large scale. Um, as you can imagine for researchers, one of the most important information is where is the object found? And when, of course, but where is one of the most important um, parts of the information? And the third uh, example of enrichment is our research data is still used by researchers every day. So they use it, they read it, and they add new information on a daily basis. So actually, it's our um, collection is growing and growing uh, online, and still does, like every day, every minute, they use it. Um, what do we do with our data? Uh, the results of all our efforts are published online, open source, so everything is online. Uh, we've got official websites like GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, Brahms, that's a site for all the botanic uh, data, and we've developed our own bio portal, uh, which you can, also you can also see, and I think it's nice if I show you a bit how it works because that really shows um, the information we have and how you can, you all can look into it and uh, see what we have. For instance, if you do, you don't have to use the scientific name, you can also just do mouse. You get, you get the scientific name in there and you see how many uh, results there are, 28. And it shows you the information about the species names and also the specimens we have in our collection. But also, if you want to know about, I don't know, if you love orchids, you can search and you see we have 253 hits with orchids. And this is free online for everybody to use and shows actually what we have in our collections because we have a lot of researchers worldwide coming to Naturalis because they want to research the object itself. Online, you can research it, of course, you can see the data, but um, a lot of time they need a sample to research it. So now they know what we have in our collection, they can contact us and they can send a request if they can come over and do research. So this allows us to um, really show the world what we have and continues to grow, obviously. I don't know why it's small. Oh, there we are. As you can imagine, we also face some challenges with this project, <laughs> minor ones. Um, and I think the first challenge is in, I didn't put it up here, but is in the prior to prioritization process, because as you can imagine, every researcher in our Seventy people leave. We had our digi streets, very experienced staff, but now the line has to take over. That's difficult because everybody thinks, oh, we already have so much work to do, we can't do digitization as well. And uh, at the same time, it is important that they do it because everything becomes online again. The quality versus quantity uh, was. Uh, was also a difficult part <coughs> because the researchers, of course, they want as high as possible. But we did a research that the difference be between uh, 300 and 600 is not even that big, but the amount of data is huge, the difference. 
So if you want 600 DPI, it will cost you a lot more than 300 DPI. So for the, the overall project, we decided 300 DPI, and still researchers now can do it on demand if they really want 600 DPI, 1,000 DPI. Uh, but then it goes per item and not for the whole project. Processing these large number of data and one central database for different kind of collections with different needs and demands is also quite a challenge. Um, what we developed is um, a database on type of collection. So each type of collection has actually its own forms where the researchers can type in their metadata. We started with one form that of course didn't work because one needed this and the other one needed that. So we split it and, and at this moment we have, um, I don't know how many forms, I think about 20 for all different types of collection. And of course the storage, the large numbers of images. Um, and that was a, um, a big challenge. And I think we had a good solution by outsourcing it at the Image and Sound Institution and not doing it ourselves. Um, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much.